views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to the Bronx Buzz. This is Bronx Nets program where we talk to writers and journalists and editors and photographers and filmmakers, videographers, anybody who's putting stuff out in the, the borough of the Bronx. And uh, this evening we're thrilled because uh, we do have a deputy editor with us. And uh, in our second segment, we're also going to talk to uh, a Bronx guy who no longer lives in the Bronx, but he's one of the fiercest advocates for people with disabilities that you will ever find anywhere. But right now, let's uh, say hello to our longtime friend, Jean-Marie Everly, uh, who is uh, the deputy editor at City Limits. Nice to have you, Jean-Marie. Hi, Gary. Nice to see you. Nice to see you again. Um, first of all, just um, uh, reporting and writing. How's it been for you uh, during a time when you really can't get where you want to be and uh, you can't, like, knock on people's door and say, hi, what's going on? How, how have you been able to do your thing? Yeah, so I've been mostly working from home, um, so I've been lucky enough to be able to do that. Um, and obviously, yeah, it kind of changes the whole nature of reporting on stories. As a reporter, you kind of always want to go to things in person, as you know. Um, and so we're a little bit limited in that, although, you know, I think some of that is starting back up for some places. Um, I'm still doing a lot of my reporting over the phone and um, email and relying on the remote, um, socially distant, friendly ways. But yeah, it's definitely been a major shift. A shift. And, you know, I will tell you, for me, you know, I'd always rather be in the studio. On the other hand, it's a little more convenient. I didn't ask, have to ask you to travel to, you know, uh, our studios or anything like that. Uh, speaking of travel, you have been um, a, a really good reporter for City Limits on uh, travel and transportation issues. Uh, and we're a couple of weeks out on this thing, but uh, you did a story of fear of traffic and crashes as New Yorkers skip subway, car, subway for cars and bikes. Let's talk about the changing nature of transportation in the city of New York and in the borough of the Bronx. Yeah, sure. So this was um, this particular story was about a report that came out um, at the beginning of September, um, and that was from an advocacy group called Transportation Alternatives, um, which you might be familiar with them. They basically, as the name implies, advocates for um, alternative transportation outside of mostly car usage. Um, so they do a lot of advocacy for cycling and biking. Um, pedestrian walkable streets, that sort of thing. Um, and so they have looked at a number of different metrics um, and found um, some really interesting things about the way people have changed their travel behavior since the start of the pandemic. Um, so obviously in the beginning of the lockdown um, and when things were um, you know, really kind of at their peak here in New York, um, there wasn't a lot of travel happening at all um, other than essential workers um, and subway ridership was way down, bus ridership was way down, um, driving was also way down too. Um, because people weren't obviously going into work the way they normally would. Most of us were staying home if we were lucky enough to do that. Um, but they have found that since sort of that peak, um, especially over the summer, um, some things have happened um, where driving has increased again. Um, so uh, I think the report found that um, driving had, they looked at things like bridge and tunnel um, toll passings and um, uh, kind of traffic levels in general. They weren't up to completely where they were at pre-COVID levels, but pretty close. Um, so people were driving again, but subway um, ridership has still been pretty uh, pretty drastically down compared to pre-COVID levels. Um, bus ridership still also down um, compared to pre-pandemic levels, but less so than subways. So it does indicate that um, people might be opting and are opting to take the bus more. Um, the buses and seem the, to be the, the more subway. popular option than the subway, yeah. Well, let's talk about the cars and roads first. Certainly when the pandemic happened and we were locked down in, the, I guess, the month of March, I would look out my apartment window and uh, looked to the streets and it was like, wow, it's li literally living in a ghost town. Certainly people weren't even on the street and there were no cars. People weren't going to school. Uh, I think for a while the buses were uh, shut down and that was bizarre. But even now I find, and I do drive around the city, uh, we ha I haven't taken the subway um, uh, much at all actually since this all started. Um, the, the, the traffic in the city seems to be less. 
I mean, I, I understand that people are not taking the subway, they're taking their cars, but there's still a sense that we're not like we were, uh, certainly in terms of crowding on the streets. And that's only one person's perception. I don't drive everywhere, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do, do you have any thoughts on that? Is there any data to support what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't know the hard numbers, um, but I do know that, um, you know, the report that I cited in this story, um, they said, and this was at, um, so this is the beginning of September, so September 2020, traffic levels. I don't know exactly how they measure that, um, but traffic levels were down 9% from last year compared to this time. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty close to normal, but still down, as you note, um, which makes sense because people still aren't necessarily going into the office, right? Um, most of us are, if we're lucky enough to, working from home. But I think it's this idea that the change is so um, different from what we're seeing in public transit, that there's a fear, and a lot of people are afraid of this, that because people might be nervous to take the subway, um, they're going to opt to drive instead, and that this will, as we continue to reopen, as more things and more people maybe start to head back to the office, um, they're going to choose driving to do that, um, which, as you know, um, is if you drive, like, that's going to mean headaches for people who do drive um, traffic, um, so maybe we're not there yet, but I think the fear is that that could be coming if this behavior pattern continues, if people decide to avoid the subway and opt instead to get a car or to drive um, a place where they normally maybe would have taken, um, you know, the, the A train or whatever. People I know who have taken the subway and do take the subway to go to work or w wherever, um, they report that overall it's been okay in terms of them being able to be socially distant to whatever degree they can and also to be wearing masks. And so uh, it's, it'll be interesting to see what happens if more people do get on the subway. And I, we don't really have to talk about this directly, but the buses and subways and the MTA are really having a financial problem. Uh, and exactly. so th that's kind of a side issue, um, but it will be interesting to see. The other thing I do definitely want to talk to you about are um, bicycles. And my perception uh, of being in, I haven't been in every borough. I think I've been in three of the five boroughs in New York, uh, New York, Manhattan, the Bronx, and Brooklyn. Um, my perception is that there are more bike riders than ever before. And um, I actually see this as a good trend. I mean, why not? Yeah, definitely. And that's what this report found as well. So they looked at things like city bike usage, um, which has been increasing. I think it's been increasing every month since about April when the pandemic started. Obviously, people looking for what they consider like a um, less you know, a more COVID safe option. Um, you're on a bike by yourself, so you don't have to sit next to anybody. Um, and things like, um, so the uh, bridges where there are bike crossings, they do monitor um, ridership levels there, and those have also been increasing. So it's something that we're definitely seeing um, and that a lot of people are excited about. Um, so I know a lot of advocacy groups are really leaning on the city to kind of lean into that and to do things like add more protected bike lanes um, and make it easier for people to get around by bike safely since so many people seem to be opting for it now. You suggested it, but I'm going to focus on it. it. You know, for people who are saying, well, I can't go to the gym anymore, or, you know, I need a little extra fitness. I'm not, I don't feel like taking the subway. Why, why not ride a bicycle? And, and it seems a little, you know, if you live in Queens or even the Bronx, you say, well, gee, you, you know, you work in Manhattan, but you know what? People can do it. And, and uh, you know, you can done that West Side Highway. There's a, a straight lane that goes all the way downtown. Certainly, if you're um, in one of the other boroughs, uh, in Queens or Brooklyn, you can uh, cross those uh, uh, East River bridges. I mean, it's a very fascinating look. But then, of course, if you have more bike riders, much like when we put uh, the outdoor restaurant uh, uh, you know, um, uh, locations throughout uh, the city, and I've seen them all, all over Manhattan, you need more bike lanes. And Again, th this is all part of a long-term change that I think the city is going to have to address. Um, are you aware of any talk about uh, increased bike lanes? I know that uh, 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 Scott Stringer, the controller who is running for mayor, came out with a plan to talk about doing that around schools. Um, what are your thoughts about that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think my impression is that um, that the uh, the city administration and the DOT um, will say that they've been steadily adding bike lanes, that they've done a lot of dramatic increases. Advocates tend to say that they haven't done it quickly enough um, and that they would like to see that accelerated, especially in light of the pandemic, in light of more people turning to cycling. Um, and I think that you're right in that, you know, there's always kind of this conflict when it comes to street usage, um, and which we're seeing with things like the open restaurants. And so there's a lot of calls, I think, for people who see the pandemic um, as terrible as it is, but also to be sort of an opportunity to reimagine the way like that the city streets look. Um, and I think that that's going to be a discussion that is going to be going on for a long time, for sure. You know, I've been talking uh, at length uh, on the air and off the air about uh, this has been a very terrible time, but if we do things right, maybe we can have some changes that would be worthwhile in, in, in the long run. More people using bikes, using their energy, you know, getting exercise and uh, creating new bike lanes, I think certainly could be a um, uh, one of the advantages we'll get. Before we run out of time, uh, Jean Marie, our guest Jean Marie Evely from uh, City Limits, um, I want you to just talk about this uh, internship program that uh, you are still excited about pandemic or not at the uh, city limits. This is real important. It's important to me too. Yeah, so we have um, City Limits has for a number of years run a internship program for um, young uh, students in New York. It's open to um, uh, later high school students, so juniors and seniors, and also recent graduates, freshmen in college, um, or that equivalent age range. Um, and it's a journalism training program. So our goal is really to kind of train and um, get people excited, young people excited about journalism and show them how to use, um, you know, investigative techniques and to ask questions about their communities and to investigate their communities. Um, so we're going to have that starting. Actually, we have a new cohort starting on Tuesday. Um, oh. Obviously, the program is all remote now. Um, we actually did our first remote version ever this summer. So it was all like this over Zoom, um, which, you know, it's not the same as being together in person, but it went really well. We had a great group um, and they write stories for us. So they spend the semester working on and reporting out stories. Um, over the summer, they did a number of COVID-related and pandemic stories. Um, so it's very exciting, um, and we'll have more work from them in the next couple of months. So I, I am very grateful, you know, as somebody in the media, and uh, as you well know, somebody interested in journalism, I'm very gratified by that, and especially using the Bronx as, you know, their, their place of study, uh, I think is uh, just fantastic, because the more people we have, like Jean Marie Evely, doing all this work, the better off we'll be in the, in the borough of the Bronx. So Jean Marie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Say hello to Jarrett and all my buddies over there. At I City will. Limits. And um, uh, we'll, we'll see you around again. We'll look for everything that you're writing and um, a great work. And thanks for being with us again. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Take care. Okay. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, uh, one, of the, one of the best Bronx people that you'll ever meet because he is uh, completely dedicated to advocating for people with disabilities. Don't go away. We know that people are dealing with the health crisis, but there's also a lot of food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options, and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, and they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community, and, and we couldn't get the help. And there's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the State Health Department's hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people. Well, it's going to go way further than we actually can understand. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality. Okay, back with you on the Bronx Buzz. I was talking about him earlier. Uh, he's a longtime friend of mine, a longtime friend of the Bronx. He left the Bronx, but he's still a Bronxite, and he'll tell you that. Uh, and yep. um, uh, let's uh, welcome back to, to the Bronx on BronxNet Television, uh, my good friend Larry Sila. Lawrence, nice to see you again. Nice to see you, Gary. Uh, finally, I'm glad to be back. Um, yeah, I was on before, and now I'm on again. Here so. you are again. Um, uh, Lawrence is, uh, uh, I'm going to mention it, he, he founded a TV show that was on BronxNet Television for many years called Special People, Special Issues. And um, uh, he decided it was time to go to Vermont 
He took he and his wife went up there, and what do you think he did? Yep. He founded a TV network up in Vermont. Tell me about no, uh, not the TV network, a it's TV show. TV show. I call it a network because you're the only one doing what you do. Tell yes. me a little bit about your uh, the transition from the Bronx to Vermont, and what did you really want to do when you got up there? Um, well, I'm going to say this again, and I've told um, your viewers before. The reason why we moved up here was for better services and uh, better housing. And now that all this thing with coronavirus is happening, um, it's really good to find appropriate services, especially now. Um, you know, we had to find appropriate housing. Um appropriate services i'm i'm getting service certain services in vermont my wife is getting certain services and um and it's a wonderful thing especially to have doctors right across the street um who doesn't want to live across the street from your service provider your position but you're really a, a living example of what it is that you work on and that is that is really a um a, a beautiful thing um because oh, news i'm sorry no no you, news, you go to it go ahead because news doesn't really want to touch services or um, they really don't want, you know, a lot of people with um, special needs have been in a bad, li a bad light for years uh, being in institutions. And after, for example, after Willowbrook uh, State School, which wasn't a, a school in the first place, but after it, it, it closed in Staten Island by Geraldo Rivera and parents and advocates, um, and Dr. Michael Wilkins, who let Geraldo in in the first place, um, then um, things started going from there, and the whole advocacy movement started going from there. Yeah, and and that's, then, something, that's something that you take very seriously. I, I, I want to make sure we have time for what we originally uh, wanted to talk to you about. Ruth Bader exactly. Ginsburg, a Supreme Court justice, as we all know, uh, passed away. Um, I was not aware of it. She advocated for many different causes. You said she's been a leading champion of... Uh, she's been one of the leading champions of... Well, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, started advocating for women's rights in the first place. And remember, back in the 1960s, I don't know if anybody out in your audience have... Um, there's a movie based on her life when she was younger in the movie Felicity Huffman plays her and it's called on the basis of sex and, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg fights to become a lawyer in this movie. And what happens, you know, um, back in the sixties, um, uh, certain, uh, certain groups, um, African Americans, women, they're, everybody's trying to fight for a little piece of the pie, quote unquote. And, Fast forward now to where we were, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, she's really championed um, for the causes of people with special needs and groups with special needs. Starting in uh, 1999, when she was one of the judges that sat on uh, the case of the Olmstead Act in um, the Olmstead Act in 1999 was a civil rights. Uh, part of the civil rights movement for people with special needs and community inclusion, you know, living on one's own, having a job, et cetera, et cetera. And she was really championing um, for people who were mentally and physically challenged. Talk, talk to me about what the Olmstead Act is. I mean, this was the Olmstead Act basically, basically is a piece of legislation that specifically says that a, a person with a special needs allowed, is allowed to live on one's own, you know, without um, some people that are higher functioning. Now there's, low, there's lower functioning, but people that are uh, even, um, people that are lower functioning can live on their own with, com you know, community help. That's basically what that is. So the you Olmstead couldn't Act, be moved. Let, let me just interpret that. You couldn't be moved out if you because you had a disability. I mean, that's basically what what she yeah. did. It seems completely logical. It's it was sad that she had to do that, but she she fought for that. That's wonderful. Yeah, and also there was a, another huge piece of movement that um, 
Ruth Bader Ginsburg did. And that and and it's a two parts. The, well, the Olmstead Act, and then part of that is that she also fought for employment and people with special needs. But also, not only that, she also fought now. If you were, um, I hate using this word, but the word mentally retarded, way back when, was a horrible word that is not used. So what Ruth, Ruth Bader Ginsburg did was she made sure that if you are mentally or physically, really, really physically challenged, she made sure that you were not executed in prison if you happen to be in prison and they would try to really rehabilitate you in some way. So this is you, actually a, a landmark thing because in many cases, when they talk about uh, criminals who commit crimes, uh, maybe on death row, uh, they immediately say, uh, you know, if somebody has, a, 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 I know you don't like the word MR, mental retardation, if they are, if they ha are inflicted in this way, then they should get different treatment. And uh, she was she was a leader in that fight, and of course the Supreme Court. It, it, exactly. Well, um, let me just uh, let your viewers know: people that are MR, um, they have an IQ of seventy-five or below. So, if you have an IQ of seventy-five or below, that catchment point, that means you would be considered uh, MR. Mm -hmm. So that's what that is. And, and she uh, drew that. Um, Larry, when you think about people like this, I mean, not that there's anybody like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she's one of a kind, but when you yeah. think of someone um, who has done what she has done, can you even imagine the impact she's had? And, and, and well, she, like, like I had said before, um, sometimes, okay, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was one of those people um, and there's been several other advocates, Judith Human and uh, and other other advocates like uh, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Sometimes people need other people to speak up for them if they can't speak up for themselves. Sort of like what we do for Ableton on Air. Um, our TV show is, is is such where we speak up for those who can't. Mm -hmm. That's what and, that is. And, and what she did, um, you know, I mean, it says so much about her. And of course, the loss um, is, is so tragic. Uh, Larry, you started talking about it. Uh, why don't, let's talk a little bit about Abled and On Air. Uh, as I said, you went from the Bronx and uh, uh, Special People, Special Issues. And then you went up to Vermont and didn't waste a moment and created Abled and On Air. Tell me what it is and, and what you've been able to do. Able to On Air is a program that focuses similar, it's something similar to special people, special issues, but it, it, focus on abil uh, it focuses on abilities, not the disability of the person. And what we do is, um, well, during coronavirus, it's kind of hard to go out in the field, but we do, uh, we're doing studio as well. And what we do is we interview people who have gone through, uh, besides their challenges, that they're, they're able to do a lot of things. And uh, we're also interviewing groups that are helping people with, with um, abilities, as we call it. Do you have any numbers or any way of measuring the, the number of people who need uh, these kinds of supports and are in this situation in Vermont? Well, um, in terms of marketing, I'll give you an example. Um, Washington County, the county that we're in in Vermont, uh, has a, a lot of services um, for people with mental and physical challenges. But as far as um, globally, let's put it this way. What's to say that a person doesn't have a challenge? So globally, it's not just local issues now. Globally, um, the number is huge. It, it, it's a larger number. Like, I looked at numbers the other day, for example, Gary, of those individuals in this world now that are not working, that are challenged, that could be doing something. Okay. Right. One of the things, one of the things that, I'll give you an example, that New York did in terms of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, New York got rid of what we call 
um, peace workshops. Now, what a peace workshop is, it's like a factory of sorts. It's a factory building where a person with a special need would make something. Let's say a key ring, for example. If the parts of a key ring have to be put together, how fast can that person do it? And if they can do it the fastest, they get paid the most. Right. That's what a peace workshop is. But what's to say that the slowest person couldn't do it faster? So that, that's what New York did. New York and other states, including Vermont, got rid of these peace workshops because it's sub, uh, what do you call it? Sub minimum wage. Right. Okay. So that, that somebody, think of how, how tra- what you think about all the time. How it's tra- tragic. Yeah, how tragic this is that somebody, given the opportunity, they could do better. But if they're yeah, exactly. given the opportunity by law and they give uh, you know, people a, a chance to deny them, then, of course, we're not but getting... By, but by law, they're not allowed to make... Uh, sub-minimum wage would be something like $1.25 an hour. I don't even want to hear about it. It's it's so disgusting. Yeah, it, it, that that's the that's horrible numbers. So um, whatever minimum wage is now uh, in food service, example, it's between fifteen and seventeen dollars an hour. What's to say a person can't do something and get paid that? Of course, Larry. Uh, just with a final word here, talk about Ableton on air. How can people in the Bronx see it, watch it, enjoy it, learn from it? advocate uh, uh give us just a little bit about that well um if you have a computer um well it's in vermont it, it will be in the bronx soon soon i know you're working and trying to get it here we know we're that. working on it we're working on that but um able to on air right now can be seen at www.orcamedia.net that's o-r-c-a media.net and also those that want to uh log on to the podcast we have a podcast as well able to on air can be listened to on spotify and anchor fm so that would be www um dot spotify anchor dot spotify.com yeah Right. Okay. Larry, uh, listen, you're one of the best people that I know. I, 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 I love and respect people who advocate because they have to, and you just can't stop, can you? <laughs> um, it has to be done because if, it, if it's not done, who would? That's it. La- Lawrence yeah. Seiler, abled and on air and um, uh, from the Bronx and uh, has, has taken a bit of the Bronx wherever he goes and certainly that advocacy. We appreciate all that you have done here in the Bronx. And uh, of course, for the people in Vermont and uh, people really all over the world who can check out Abled and On Air. Thank you so much. Say hi to everybody. Okay. Thank you. Folks, all right. That's, that's the Bronx Buzz for uh, this evening. What a treat tonight to spend some time with uh, Lauren Seiler. And also thanks to Jean Marie Evely. Uh, we will uh, have Richie Torres on Bronx Talk this week. Uh, and on and on and on. Good night.